our scripture lesson today comes from the good news according to Acts. Uh, this is the good works of the Spirit, uh, the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. Um, in Acts chapter 1, we're going to uh, read this story about how Jesus ascends. He goes up to heaven. This is post-resurrection. And then he's about to go on up into heaven. And I want you to pay close attention to who's there. Let's read God's good word together. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus as well as his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. In just a few weeks, we'll gather for our first ever Christmas Eve service here in this building. And we'll take a little candle. Looks about like this. Actually, looks exactly like this. Um, and then we will take it and we will light from the flame of the Christ candle that the light and joy and power of Christ would live in us to go out and be a blessing, to be light in the world, light in the darkness. And as it passes from person to person, row to row, the room, as you can imagine with me, will fill with light. The light of the people of God to go out and to be a blessing to the world. And we will sing. Silent night, holy night, all is calm. All is bright round yon virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild. You know it? Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. You do know. Can't, I, mean, can't, I can't wait. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be fantastic. So it all starts today, the first Sunday of Advent. And for many of us, it has already started with Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. You all remember Thanksgiving just a few days ago. You imagine yourselves around the table. You remember what that was like? The meal is over. And then you look around and you say, now what? What do we do? It's the turkey carcass just sitting there. Your dog waiting for scraps. Your kids ready to go do something else. That's how it was at our house anyway. Our son John Mark is home from college. That was a fantastic time. He's on his way back now. And we're like, yes, it's so good to have everybody home. And in our family tradition, once the Thanksgiving meal is over, uh, my mom and dad were over, Chantel's family was over, my sister and her husband, their kids came over in the evening. And um, sort of as that all sorts of winds down for our family, our boys always look at what's on at the movies. We love to go see our movie out at a theater somewhere Thanksgiving night. It's sort of our family tradition. So John Mark was like, Dad, I want you to see this movie with me. I saw it last night. I want to go see it again. I want you to, you know, watch it with me. I'm like, okay. So John Mark and Noah and I, we load up in the car, you know, give kisses to mom and dad and the family and everybody starts to go on their way. We go to the movie. Uh, it starts at eight o'clock. It's a long movie. Uh, it ends at about 11, about a three hour movie. And uh, we, we get home about 1130. And I'm getting ready for bed. It's been a wonderful, good, long day. I'm full of turkey, ready for my deep winter's nap to get ready for Advent. And then I noticed something. Something different this year. My wife was missing. Chantel was gone. And her mother's car, who had been in our driveway, it was gone as well. And her mother was gone. 
So I went and looked on the back door for the note because Chantel always leaves me a note if she's not going to be around. You know, just let the family know where she is. No note. So I got on my phone and I texted her. Have you been abducted? No response. So I call her. Voicemail. It's almost midnight on Thanksgiving. I didn't think we had such bad crime rate in the Homestead neighborhood. What has happened? Where she is gone. It's a little before midnight. I get a call back. You know where she was? Ulta Beauty Supply. <laughs> Who knew? You, apparently, you can get big, sexy hair products for $6.99. Normally, like $17. She and her mom loaded up. Saved us lots of money. <laughs> right? And she saw some of you there, too, she tells me. It was a good night. I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to people having fun with their family, going and getting hair products on Thanksgiving. That's okay. That's okay. Just tell us where you are. And, and so you know what happens? They come home, and my mother-in-law makes the best fudge in the world. And so she knew that I was, you know, wanting some of that. And so my mother-in-law has turned on the mixer to make me fudge at 1 in the morning. On Friday morning. Silent night. Not hardly. Not at my house, not at your house, not in this world, not for a long time. No peace with a college student comes home. He wakes up about midnight, right? Making fudge and shopping to the wee hours this morning. There's no silent night, peaceful night. There's no peace. Hasn't been. Not from the time of Christ today. There's, there's not really peace. Certainly no peace for the police officers in Ferguson these days. No peace for the business owners, wondering if their business, their lifelong work is going to be nothing but ashes and ruin in the morning. No peace for teenagers who are afraid to even get a pellet gun out because it might cost them their life. Not in Ferguson, not in Pennsylvania. No peace in Iraq, no peace in Afghanistan, no peace in Syria these days. See, it hasn't been a silent night for a long time long time. The world needs a Savior, desperately. Needs hope, needs Jesus to come now. So we gather and we wait on this first Sunday of Advent. If you have your sermon notes, I invite you to take those out. Today is the start of Advent. That's your first blank there. That's a Latin word that means coming. And we look forward to Jesus coming again, both in the manger and as King of kings and Lord of lords. We need that Savior. So as we prepare our hearts and minds for Christmas, we're going to look at the life of Mary. The Theotokos. I love the way the early church puts it. Theotokos. Theo meaning God and tokos meaning bearer of. The very bearer of God. That's what the early church called her. Mary, more than any other mortal, knew and loved her son Jesus. And we're going to look at his life through her eyes. She knew the pain of his birth, the struggles of his ministry, his death on a cross. Few others were there at the cross, but his mom was there. His closest friends were there. And as we get ready to celebrate Jesus' birthday, one of my colleagues says, Christmas is not your birthday, so how will you celebrate it? Because whose birthday is Christmas? Jesus' birthday, of course. So doesn't it make sense to honor Jesus on his birthday? Well, yes, of course. And it makes sense to honor our family on their birthdays as well. But Christmas is Christ's birthday, Christ's mass, Christ's celebration. So what do you think that Jesus might want as we prepare our hearts and minds? How do you think Jesus might want you to live for the next 30 days in preparation for his big celebration? You know, I wonder what Jesus' mom did, how she celebrated and honored his life. Scholars believe that Mary gave birth to Jesus when she was only 13 or 14 years of age. What that means is that more than likely she would have been about uh, my wife and I's age when he died in her 40s. That's hard to think about, to lose one of your children at this age. And for him to be publicly executed by the state for crimes that he did not commit. Have you ever stopped to wonder what that kind of trauma could do to a person? 
I mean, it's amazing, isn't it, that Mary just didn't lay down and die right there at the brutality of what had happened to her family. Most believe she would have been alone by that time. Certainly Joseph would have been much older and probably had passed on. Yet some people even today know this sort of pain. And they must decide, we must decide, what will become the rest of our lives when it's not a silent night. Mary had to decide, would she give in to despair or would she hold on to hope? This is the Sunday of hope. And it changes everything. It changes everything. So, this is the Sunday of hope. Will you say that with me? This is the Sunday of hope. And that changes everything. Uh, next week, we're going to look at love at the cross. Uh, and then back up to joy at the temple. And then in week four, the announcement of the Prince of Peace. And on Christmas Eve, of course, we'll celebrate the birth of Jesus. It's a wonderful time. I want to thank Reverend Adam Hamilton and Church of the Resurrection uh, for the sermon series. Uh, I've adapted it, and we'll look at different pieces of that between now and Christmas Eve and finish um, on Christmas Eve. But it really boils down to this, and that is this, that in the messiness of life, God is at work bringing blessing out of pain. That's what we need to remember. God is at work bringing blessing out of pain, and that's the message of Christmas. That's the message of Christmas. Now, as I was reflecting um, on this story, I started um, going through the Bible, and it, I was reminded that in Hebrew or in Aramaic, uh, Mary is actually an alliteration of Miriam. And so you think about being a person of the Hebrew faith, and their quintessential story is the Exodus event. So do you all remember in the Old Testament, perhaps, that Miriam was the older sister of Moses? Moses meaning drawn forth. And so Miriam was there when Moses was placed in the river and his life at risk and raised by the Pharaoh's daughter. It was Miriam who went to the Pharaoh's home and raised Moses in the ways of faith. And it's in that story that Miriam then was the forebearer of the one who would bring their people out of slavery into new life, out of slavery in Egypt and into new life. And then after Moses passes, it's Joshua who picks up the mantle and carries the people into the promised land. Or he's actually God's leader who does that. God does it and Joshua leads him through that. And isn't it interesting that 1,300 years later, Mary, named after Miriam, would give birth to Yeshua, named after Yahshua in the Old Testament. Isn't that interesting? And so if you were a Hebrew and you heard that this girl named Mary, named after Miriam, was about to give birth to Jesus, Yeshua, named after Joshua, which means Yahweh is salvation, your ears would perk up. Something big's about to happen. God is at work. God is on the move. God is up to something good. Reverend Adam Hamilton, in his book, uh, Not a Silent Night, puts it this way. He says, life doesn't go according to our plans. That's right. Sometimes it's hard and painful and scary, yet in the messiness of life, God is at work bringing blessing out of pain. That's the message of Christmas. It was true in the time of Exodus. It was a time true in the time of Jesus, and it's true in our time today. So let's begin to look at Mary's final years. That's a little tricky proposition, actually, because there's only one verse in all the Bible um, after the resurrection of Jesus and ascension of Jesus that we find um, Mary mentioned by name. And that's in Acts 1, 14. Um, so we'll remember the scripture that we read earlier, that they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. It's really right there by the Garden of Gethsemane. It's near Jerusalem, about a Sabbath day's journey away, which is about three quarters of a mile. And when they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. And there were all the apostles, and who else? Mary, Jesus' mom, as well as his brothers. Now, I don't know uh, if this is true or not, but in my mind, um, when I think of Mary uh, being with all those young men, um, you know, she's uh, in her 40s. Those guys are probably in their 20s. Can you imagine that, what, what that looks like around your Thanksgiving table? Who's in charge in that scenario? Mary, right? I mean, she's Jesus' mom. They're like, what do we do? He, he's died. He's resurrected. He's, what do we do? I can almost hear Mary say, like, you know what to do. He told you what to do. You know, look at his life and his mission and his message. Bring good news to the poor. Sight to the blind. Set at liberty those who are oppressed. This is who Jesus says he is, what he came to do. Let's get after it. Let's spread the good news to the world. 
You know who my son is. Let's get to it. And Mary is there, right there in the thick of it, starting the church in Jerusalem. But we don't have a lot of biblical history to go on to know exactly what the end of her life or the last years of her life are like. So we look back to our forebears and uh, our forefathers and foremothers. Uh, we look at our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, and they commemorate Mary's death on August 15th. That's your blank there. That's when they have what's known as the Feast of the Assumption or Dormition, depending on uh, which tradition you're a part of. The two different names point to similar ideas held by Catholic and Orthodox Christians concerning on what happened at Mary's death. Now, Roman Catholics believe that Mary was taken up bodily to heaven shortly after her burial. This is a special way in which Mary was honored by God, uh, as God had done with Enoch and with Elijah in the Old Testament. Now, you may remember, uh, if you um, sort of study the Old Testament, that Enoch and Elijah were righteous people. They were people who did uh, what God wanted them to do, and they were taken up or assumed into heaven without experiencing death. And so we have two scriptures that we look at there. The first is found in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. And we read that Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more because God took him, just, just took him right up. In the same way that Jesus ascended into heaven. Now the scriptures say in the first um, book of the Bible that Enoch was simply taken up to heaven. Likewise, in 2 Kings, we find that Elijah also was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. Ascended in a whirlwind into heaven, the scripture says. And so the early church believes that Mary was also taken up to heaven. Now, at this point, uh, as Methodists, and you know, we kind of have a foot in the Protestant tradition and a foot uh, in the early church as well, Roman Catholic and Orthodox. And so you say, well, what do, what do we do with that? Well, listen to the stories of the tradition. And I would remind you that why Scripture is primary for us, uh, that Scripture also is handed to us through the church. The Bible, as we know it, was not put together until the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 by the people of God, the church. And so they go together. Orthodox Christians then believe that Mary died, uh, which is a euphemism they use, um, they say fell asleep. And on the third day after dying, her body was taken up to heaven. Uh, and so the Latin word for sleep is dormitio, uh, thus the feast of the dormition recalls Mary's death and subsequent bodily uh, going on up to heaven. So throughout most of church history, starting at least in the 5th century, if not before, Christians believed that Mary was taken up to heaven right after her death. One version of the story uh, that I like a lot tells that three days before her death, Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel. And now this is the same angel that came to her when she was a girl of 13 or 14 to announce that she would give birth to the Christ. Now at the second appearance, Gabriel looked no older than before. And this is in some history, in, in art history here. There's Gabriel um, telling Mary, you're going to die in three days. Now, the trick is that Gabriel looked exactly the same because angels don't age, but Mary, of course, had aged. And this, by, by this time, she was probably 60 to 64 years of age. So when she hears that she's going to die, she asks that the apostles would gather one last time so that she could see them. They'd been scattered around the world preaching the gospel. And the Holy Spirit says... Uh, has it that he supernaturally gathered all of them, including Paul, around Mary's bedside. Except, and this is where it gets good, only Thomas was unable to be present. Man, that guy, he cannot get anywhere on time to save his life. Right? Thomas doesn't make it. So, as the story goes, Mary was then laid to rest in the tomb. Thomas arrives three days later. And according to the story, when he arrived, he asked to see Mary's body. So when the crypt was opened... The disciples found, much to their surprise, that Mary's body was gone. And only a burial shroud remained, just like Jesus. The same thing had happened. Now, whether you believe these stories or not, that's not the main focus of our attention. But one thing that Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox all agree upon is the resurrection of the dead. We say it every time we gather in this church in the Apostles' Creed, that we believe in the resurrection of the dead. And how Mary's death happened is not so important to us as the fact that as she approached death, she undoubtedly believed that when she died, she would see her son, Jesus, again. We are people of the resurrection. We are Easter people. We live in the hope of the resurrection. Now, I've been the pastor of this church for 15 years, and I know that Christmas time for many of us can be very, very hard, particularly if you have lost a loved one or you've gone through significant trauma uh, in the last year or so. It can really intensify those feelings of loss and grief. But I also want to remind us that Christmas is always linked to Easter. They're a package deal. They go together. 
So we celebrate Christmas, not just about the baby, but as the King of kings and Lord of lords, which gives us hope. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, that when this perishable body puts on imperishability and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. This is good news for us. The infant Jesus would grow up and say in John 11, I am the resurrection and life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, they will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me, they will never die. Jesus had shared these words openly. Mary would have known them, and she would live in the hope of the resurrection. And in Acts 1, the scripture reminds us that as Jesus ascends... She would have seen him then. She would know the resurrected Christ, and she would know her son's desire for the salvation of the world. Now, Mary witnessed the terrible and tragic death of her son, and then she had the joy of seeing Christ resurrected from the dead. But then 40 days later, she sees him leave once more in the ascension. And so if Mary died around age 60, it means that she lived roughly 15 years after Jesus' death on the cross. What do you do do after you lose your son in such a horrible way? It's a hard question. I've been with parents in this church who have lost children. Babies. Teenagers. Young adults. And even grown adults whose parents are still alive. And having walked through each of those different tragedies with those families all of them are horrible even even if you have a child that dies when they're 60 and the parents are in their 80s it's still horrible any time that a child dies before their parents it's very very difficult on the family and over time the parents do discover joy again it's possible and it does happen but there's always that sense of loss and pain that the parents feel for their children And without recounting our own sort of personal stories here in this church, I'd like to share with you some words from a woman up at Church of the Resurrection who lost her son. She writes, when you lose a child, you lose part of yourself as a woman. He was inside you. He was your flesh and your blood. And I just feel Mary's pain watching what she went through. It's absolutely catastrophic devastation at first, she writes. You eventually come to peace with it. You know that your son's in a better place. You know that you're going to see him again. But then she writes this. You view heaven in totally different ways than other people do. She's absolutely right about that. When I'm with people who have lost loved ones, heaven becomes real. Heaven becomes important in ways that it hadn't been before, that you need to know, you need to be able to hold on to hope that you will see that person again. You will see your son again, or your daughter again, or your loved one again, your brother or your sister or your parent, the one who you still hold in your heart. And the appearance of Jesus to Mary after his death would have changed everything for her. Everything. She still would have carried the grief and the suffering with her. She would have carried the sense of separation and loss that any of us would feel at the death of someone close to us. But the resurrection gave her hope. Gave her hope that she would see her boy again. Hope changes everything. Will you say that with me? Hope changes everything. There's still going to be hard times. There will still be pain. There will still be struggle. But it is the hope that changes everything. In the early church... Of course, they were heavily persecuted, and people died regularly. People that they had come to count on and lean on and pray with and live with and receive food from. And when these folks died, Paul reminded the early church not to lose heart. He writes this in 1 Thessalonians. He says, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For the Lord himself, with the cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so will be with the Lord forever. In this life and the next, friends. Therefore, encourage one another 
with these words. Don't lose hope. Hope changes everything. Paul calls us to encourage one another and to remember that the world will not always be as it is right now. This is the promise of Christmas. Jesus will grow up. He will heal people and love people and change the world. This baby boy will be king of kings and lord of lords. And he will set all things right one day. One day. So what do you think Mary did with the rest of her life? From Jesus' death to the end of her own. In those 15 years, it seems to me that it would have been so easy for her to simply lay down and die or to become depressed and to kind of just go off into the shadows. But that's not what the scriptures intimate that she does. And it's certainly not what her character uh, would have been. You see, Mary seems to have been present in this historical work of Acts 1. She actually sees her son ascended. And you'll, you'll remember that in Acts, you have Luke Acts sort of as one writer. And then over here you have Matthew. And sometimes they tell you about similar or the same event. And so what we're led to believe is that Mary was actually there when Jesus gave the Great Commission. The Great Commission is found in Matthew 28 as, as Jesus ascends, and it says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Jesus talking to those who were gathered around him, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Never forget this, I am with you. And so in the book of Acts, Luke tells the story slightly differently, but it's more than likely the same story. In Acts 1.8, he says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And, and so to kind of put this in perspective, what that means is Jerusalem, their hometown where they were right there, Judea sort of in the larger metroplex, if you will, and Samaria would be sort of like the state of Oklahoma, and to the ends of the earth is to the ends of the earth. Okay, so from where they are to expand out, to all the world. This is what Jesus is saying. It's the same story, more than likely, told twice, once by Matthew and once by Luke. So Luke records the mission Jesus gave his disciples as a co-mission. It's his mission of good news to the world, but it's something you do with him, and Mary would have heard that. Mary and the apostles and we today are to join Jesus in this co-mission with Jesus. It's clear um, through the rest of Acts that Jesus followers didn't simply pray and then go away. They also prepared for their work in taking Jesus' message to the world. And if you look through the New Testament, you see that in Corinth and in Rome and Thessalonica and Ephesus and Colossae. All throughout the world, the movement is on. So within a week, while they were praying together, the Holy Spirit falls upon them, and they launch the church in Jerusalem. Mary, right there in the middle of it, mentioned by name in the Scripture so that we would know. Which is remarkable in that she was a woman, and most women were not mentioned at all. Uh, in those days. The, the, the author's making a point to let us know that she was there. They were preaching the gospel, inviting others to faith, baptizing and teaching, and meeting together in homes, worshiping in the temple courts, and sharing with any who had need. So where would Mary have been? I believe she would have been right in the middle of it, and probably telling the boys what to do. Oh, Peter, you need to go do that. Hey, Paul, and another thing. Hey, Matthias, you know, Matthias Matthew, hey, over here, you know. Doing the things. Have you, were, did you all do Thanksgiving? Is that not how it is at your house? There's Mary in the thick of it. Starting churches all throughout the world. You see, Jesus had told his disciples to be the light of the world. And he had told his followers to teach others what he had taught them. And he told them to be his witnesses. Don't you just imagine that this is what Mary was doing during the last days of her life. I believe that she would have continued to do the things that she had done all along in her life to care for those who were hurting, to live out the words of Jesus. And by the way, those would have been words that she taught him. Think about her character. At 13, 14 years of age, when Gabriel, the messenger of God, comes to her and says, you're going to be with child and you're going to name him Jesus. You're going to be pregnant, but it's going to be of God. Now, in my character at 14, I would have run away. Because in those days, you could be stoned, you could be murdered legally, for being pregnant as a young girl without being married, which is her case. What does she say? Lord, let it be with me according to your word. Now that's character. That's faith. 
And at the end of her son's life, Jesus, he kneels in the garden. And he doesn't want to go to the cross. And his prayer sounds a lot like his mom's. Father, not what I want, but what you want. Let it be with me according to your will. And as I think about this interplay, you, you, can't you just hear little Jesus at four or five years of age gathering around his mother's knee and like, Mom, tell me again, how is it that I'm here? Tell me this again. What did the angel say to you? What did you say back to him? Were there really wise men that came from all over the world to come and see me? Really? Where's the gold? You know, where's the frankincense? Where's the myrrh? Can you tell me the stories again? So that by the, the middle of his life and the end of his life, he too could say, Lord, let it be with me. You are good. You are holy. You are faithful. You are wonderful. Let it be with me according to your will. I trust you. I trust you. Now, as your pastor, I want to be kind of careful with what I say next. And that is this. When you look at the life of Mary and what you think she was doing at the end of her life, I think, personally, that the best predictor of future behavior is past and present behavior. You know that guy at your Thanksgiving table that was a problem four years ago? Probably a problem four days ago. Right? It is kind of the same people, kind of the same. Now, I'm not saying that people can't change. Right? I don't want to weird you out. Obviously, we're people of faith. When God gets a hold of you, things can change, and they can, but we have to choose it. We have to allow it. We have to work with God in that. Mo most of the time, as you look at people's lives, they're kind of the same. The kind of person that they were at 9 is uh, normally the kind of person they are at 15, 30, 50, 60, 80. Right? And you know this. You have people that you've just always been drawn to and liked, and they were always helpful and kind and friendly and you know, that's how it goes most of the time. Not always. I'm not saying that, you know, if you're having a bad day, you can't have a better day tomorrow. You can, with hope. But by and large, people's character um, is formed by their choices, which then form their habits, which then form their character, which then, of course, form their life and their future. And this is the way life goes, in this life and the next. So it's very important what you choose. And if you look at the character of Mary, who she was at 13, 14, who she was at the cross, and how dangerous that would have been for her to be there in front of the Roman soldiers when they were crucifying her son. Of course it makes sense that she would be leading in Jerusalem, and many people believe that she started the church in Ephesus as well. The church is still divided on whether she's buried around Jerusalem or in Ephesus. They have burial sites at both places. You see, our mission is the same as Mary's mission, and that is to join the co-mission with her son Jesus, for the redemption of the world, the salvation of the world, to offer hope and help to the hopeless and the helpless, to pray and to work that our world looks more like the kingdom of Jesus that he proclaimed, where the blind see and the deaf hear, the lame walk, the oppressed are lifted up, and the captured are set free. So it's important, friends, that we choose wisely in these days, that we choose wisely. So this year, let me ask you this. How will you offer hope to people who don't have it? How will you offer encouragement and joy? Adam Hamilton writes this, and I think he's right. He says, if your Christmas doesn't include serving the poor in some way, then you've missed out on part of the mission. Because that's what Jesus says he came to do. I've come to proclaim good news to the poor. And I think that's what Jesus would have been doing with his life had he continued on. It's what Mary did with her life as she continued on in his name. Now, scholars don't agree whether Mary ever celebrated the birthday of Jesus. Many scholars believe that Jews simply didn't celebrate birthdays, and that may be true. But if she did, she would have looked back on her son's birth that night through the lens of Easter, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and with great hope, she would have known that she would see her son again soon. You see, at Christmas, we're meant to celebrate the hope of the resurrection and remember Christ's great co mission with him. I invite you to join that commission. And let's pray together this prayer of Christmas hope. Come Lord Jesus, by your spirit guide us to spaces where we can experience silence. Give us resurrection hope, the assurance that we will see you and that we will see those we love again. Give us the hope that things will not always be as they are now. Stir us up to embrace your mission for the world that in your good time, everything will be set right. In your name we pray. Amen.